uh, many areas of the faith, as we're well aware, these indications seem to be evolving and expanding. Uh, there are multiple advantages to the use of dermal fillers. They typically will provide consistent results, minimal downtime, and relatively low risk of complications. There have been many dermal fillers that have been used, um, and again, there's, a, there's an evolution here as well. A hyaluronic acid, which is the most uh, popular, most common, um, a variety of collagens, calcium hydroxyapatite, silicone, uh, implants, and then autologous fat. And there are many different fillers uh, with different trade names that have been uh, available um, and are, are changing. And if we look at the uh, evolution of the market of fillers, you can see there's been a lot of changes and a lot of progression. Um, hyaluronic acid came uh, on the scene in around 2004 um, with the uh, Restylane and eventually Juvederm, and we even have more such as Perlane in 2007. Um, and these have sort of come and gone with uh, some of the other fillers as well and their popularity. Um, there's been a more recent trend of the use of fillers in the nose, and this is a relatively newer phenomenon, and this can also provide temporary cosmetic changes uh, to the nasal contour, uh, which can mimic changes in the skeletal contour. Um, sometimes it is used uh, in lieu of a rhinoplasty, but oftentimes some surgeons have used it to touch up irregularities following a rhinoplasty. And this has been coined um, as a non-surgical rhinoplasty by uh, some physicians uh, in, the, uh, in the literature. There have been some reported complications following these injectable treatments in the nose, and I've broken these down into, into two. Uh, first would be the non-surgical complication, and second would be uh, potential surgical implications following the use of the filler in the nose. Looking at the non-surgical complications, there's a, a risk of infection, pain, persistent redness and swelling, and uh, uh, worse would be skin necrosis, which could lead to permanent skin damage. Now looking at the implications for surgery after fillers, uh, it's been reported by some that this can lead to a bumpy skin envelope which can complicate surgery. Uh, and this increases the difficulty of any revision surgery and also some damage to the skin envelope as well. Um, this was shown, these photos were generously um, uh, given by Dr. Stephen Mandy. And just to show an example of a patient uh, who had uh, some skin necrosis following a filler injection, the nasal tip and soft tissue triangle area. And you can see here the necrosis on the left and on the right side, this led to some permanent scarring in this particular patient. So the purpose of our study was to determine the present use of injectable fillers in the nose by facial plastic surgeons, to identify side effects that would have been encountered following injection, determine any effects on subsequent surgery, and see if there's a consensus recommendation among facial plastic surgeons. Our design was a physician questionnaire, which was then submitted or sent to all of the uh, members of the American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. This was an IRB-approved study, and uh, they, everyone, would, the um, all the members were emailed a link to this survey. The content of the questionnaire involved uh, a number of variables. First of all, uh, we want to look at the use of the injectables, the number of patients one had treated, the type of filler that was used, and the topographic sites of the nose that had been injected the effects on subsequent rhinoplasty, complications encountered, and treatment recommendations. Overall, we sent approximately, uh, approximately 3,000 members of the Academy uh, were sent the questionnaire, and we received 149 responses, which is a 5% uh, response rate. Overall, approximately three quarters of responding facial plastic surgeons indicated that they had indeed used an injectable soft tissue filler in the nose. Uh, and around 27% uh, had performed a rhinoplasty on a patient who had had a prior injection. Look at the number of patients injected. Most uh, indicated only injecting between one and five patients, although there were some who had injected over 20 patients. And this was approximately 20 respondents. Look at the topographic sites. The, the most popular sites were the dorsum and the nasal sidewall, although interestingly there were many who had uh, injected the tip, soft tissue triangle, the ala, the columella, and a few also in the nasal valve area. The type of fillers injected, uh, the most common was hyaluronic acid followed by hydroxyapatite, and there were some with, that injected with other uh, substances such as autologous fat and silicone. 27.5% had performed a rhinoplasty from a patient who had had a prior injection. And of these uh, 41 respondents, 27 reported no compromise whatsoever due to the filler 
whereas 14 uh, reported a compromise due to the filler that affected surgery. Two respondents said scar tissue, five uh, reported residual material, and seven reported both uh, 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 made surgery more difficult. So the primary, we asked what's the primary reason for using these injectable fillers in the nose? Uh, the most common was to, uh, for a post-operative defect for filling in, somewhere to avoid surgery, and there were some a minority that said that they used it to demonstrate what surgery could accomplish. Approximately 10% of respondents in, indicated encountering a major complication, and the most common was injection site necrosis, and that was in five respondents, with others reporting infection, nodule formation, and irrever irreversible cosmetic deformity. We tried to, in asking what, uh, what fillers associated with these major complications, Radius uh, was um, indicated by five respondents, hyaluronic acid in three, and silicone in two. About 40% encountered minor complications. These complications were, were sometimes expected and in use in other areas, such as edema, erythema, ecchymosis, and some post-operative pain. But interestingly, few respondents indicated hypopigmentation due to the color of radius, slight migration over the cartilage, and nodular extrusion of radius. 30 have encountered cosmic issues following injection nodes, such as under correction, asymmetry, and then other things such as palpable and visible filler. So, other questions were asked were, what's the percentage of your practice that you dedicate to injectable fillers? And most say less than a quarter of their practice is injectable fillers patients, where a small minority say greater than half their patients are injectable fillers patients. Preferred rhinoplasty approach among respondents? More commonly was external approach, with some reporting endonasal, and there were a few that uh, indicated they do not perform rhinoplasty at all. What percentage of rhinoplasty surgeries were primary cases versus revisions? Well, um, approximately, I guess approximately uh, 25, to, or, I'm sorry, 50 to 75 percent uh, say their primary cases, uh, that, that was the majority of saying that approximately half their cases were primary cases, whereas some said that greater than 75 percent actually were, uh, were primary cases. And there were some that tended to do more revisions in the 25 to 50 percent um, subset. And finally, we asked, is it appropriate to use injectable fillers in the nose? And we, we broke this up as far as prior to surgery and also following surgery. So those that said yes, in general, the respondents said that it was, it, they thought it was okay to inject following surgery, whereas fewer said that they thought that it was appropriate to inject prior to surgery. And there is still, as you can see on the right side, there's a, a large uh, subset that are still undecided as far as uh, their recommendation. So we had some other questions we wanted to ask based on this data. First of all, are those who encountered major complications, are they less likely to recommend injectable fillers in the nose? Again, the major complications would be injection site necrosis, nodule formation, and irreversible cosmetic deformity. So, as expected, those who injected, a, I'm sorry, who encountered a major complication were more likely not to recommend prior to surgery um, uh, compared to all respondents. And then following surgery, they also were, were more likely to say they would not recommend uh, nasal fillers in the nose. Another question, are those who encountered minor side effects less likely to recommend injectable fillers in the nose? Again, these are just expected, sometimes pain, erythema, uh, edema, and ecchymosis. Interestingly, those who encountered minor complications were more likely to recommend the use of injectable fillers in the nose prior to surgery and also following the surgery. Are those who inject more in their practice more likely to recommend injectable fillers in the nose? And as, ex as expected by us, those who inject uh, more in their practice tend to recommend, compared to all respondents, they tend to recommend the use of injectable fillers in the nose prior to surgery and somewhat following surgery as well. Are those who have performed rhinoplasty on an injected patient more or less likely to recommend injectable fillers in the nose? And this was, to me, the most interesting piece of data because those who had operated on someone who had been injected were actually more likely to recommend injecting a patient prior to surgery. And they were also more likely to recommend injecting a patient following surgery as well. Finally, do surgeons who feel it is appropriate to use fillers in the nose tend to perform an endonasal or external approach more often? Well, this, there wasn't really anything significant here other than if you look at patients, or, or, sorry, surgeons who, who tend to favor the external approach, they're slightly less likely to recommend before or after surgery, whereas those who perform uh, more endonasal surgery are slightly more likely to recommend fillers compared to all respondents. And are surgeons who perform more revision rhinoplasty is more opposed to injections in the nose. And um, with this, this, again, this data 
Typically, they're, they're slightly more likely um, to, to uh, less likely to recommend injectable fillers prior to surgery, and slightly less likely to, to recommend uh, nasal fillers following surgery. So our conclusions from this study are that injectable fillers are commonly used to provide contour changes in the nose, and both major and minor complications are commonly encountered. A minority of facial plastic surgeons feel it's appropriate to use fillers before rhinoplasty, whereas a majority of the respondents believe it's appropriate to use fillers after rhinoplasty. Those who've encountered major complications are much less likely to recommend injectables in the nose, and respondents encountering minor side effects are slightly more likely to recommend injectables. Surgeons who have performed a rhinoplasty on an injected patient are more likely to recommend injectables, and rhinoplasty surgeons who perform more revisions are finally less likely to recommend injections. So this leads to a lot of unanswered questions. A lot of this is due to the fact that there are very few studies in the literature other than the anecdotal reports as far as fillers being used in the nose. And there's, so there, there are vast uh, unanswered questions, and these are just a few. Are some fillers safer than others when used in the nose? When is it safe to inject the nose after rhinoplasty? Is it better to wait even up to one year once the tissues have redraped or the skeletal support? And what's really the true mechanism for the skin necrosis? Is it a compression necrosis or is it embolization? Thank you very much.